and it will not be apparent. All right. Hey, can everybody hear me? Is this uh, going to work? All right, last year, um, I talked about advanced React. We had like two talks here at the conference on React. Um, and I asked the audience, you know, how many people were using React? There was one person besides my team on the list. So what does it look like today? Like one year later, how many people are using React? Nice. We can, we have a whole track. I mean, it's exploded, right? But there's been a lot of community involved in React. There's a ton of open source projects. I mean, the whole thing is being driven by Facebook and people outside of Facebook. Um, today is really a best practices and an understanding of how the modern um, architectures are being built using just pure React, right? So we're going to look at basically one level below the abstraction and just look at React. Look at how data flows through React, how you architect and build components the scale, um, components that are loosely coupled to your application, like state, logic, and actions, and just really look at what's going on in the world right now for React. Uh, this is not a talk on Flux. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Is this, is that any better? You haven't yet. Well, this one's like, okay. Is that better? Okay, so again, this isn't a talk about Flux or anything other than basic pure React. And um, looking at modern best practices that have emerged over the last two years. Uh, I work locally here um, in ICE. We've been using in production React for two years. We've done a ton of things with it. Um, if you want to talk afterwards, my team is in that third row right there. We've done a lot. Um, but today, a real focus is we're going to investigate how React sees our components. So we're going to start at the basics of just rendering and virtual DOM, diffing. Uh, we're going to examine how data flows. So how do you pass data through, the, through your React tree? And what are the best practices for doing this? Um, what patterns exist? Everything today, or this entire presentation is not a presentation. It's a git book. So it's available um, on this resource right here at Jurassic Data Flow through React, same title as the talk. Um, the whole thing is there. Um, the other thing to note is that every example in here is ES6 React 14. Um, this is where we're going, so this is where we're going to start. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first thing about React 14 is that we have two distinct libraries. Um, we have React and React DOM. Um, this is really important because Facebook team is really pushing us to um, understand that virtual DOM is not the secret sauce of React. Like it, any framework, modern framework can adopt a virtual DOM system. Virtual DOM can exist just as a standalone library. Um, the real magic and allure of React is declarative style programming and this f of x equals y. Right? A function taking properties always produces the same DOM. It's item potent. That is the secret sauce of React. And that is really the message that Facebook is trying to say. So, hello world for the win, right? This is a React class. It's a stateless class. Um, it's being pushed right now as a micro component. It's perfectly valid syntax and is definitely readable. It's definitely small and maintainable and testable, right? This is a pure React class, except you have no wipe cycles on this. This is going to return a create element. So we'll get to these concepts in a second, but for the win. OK, so how will React see your code? React will see your code as a tree. Right? You have some entry point into the application, um, and then you have some kind of layout mechanism. Maybe you have menu footer sidebar um, main section, each one of those comp composes other components into making a full UI, right? But it all looks like a tree, either a fat tree, a deep tree, well, for the, either one. All right, so how does data flow through this tree? Well, we need to understand how React's gonna render our component, how you access data from a component, and really how to leverage that. So 
the basic building block of React is composition, right? Passing data from parent to child. Um, it's kind of funny because um, two years ago when I first started React, I hated this. Um, I thought it was really hard coming from Backbone where I could just get anything I wanted anytime. But this is really where you want to be. You want to be top down, creating parent elements that are pure. Their, their API is explicitly defined as properties. And you know, you're composing other pure components. So again, this is a stateless syntax. This is valid um, React. And this is what you should drive for every component. There's no state here. There's no lifecycle methods. And we'll get into how you can inject these. OK, so some modern techniques for building React. <coughs> All right, so this year especially has just blown up. Um, Redux, Recompose, the millions of Flux libraries that are kind of coming out of this. But the concepts behind them are simple. They're categories of components, like being smart, being environmentally con context aware. So smart components, we'll see in a second. Dumb components, they're what we just saw. They're products of their API. The, the properties fully define the application. It has no references to anything else inside the application. Um, pure, meaning that it's self-insulating. His should component update or is gamed for his properties. So dumb and pure work very well together. Containers, another word for smart. Order components, these are ways of functionally composing components and mixing in um, behavior. We're going to look at these. But all these concepts build Redux, build Recompose, build Flux. Without these concepts, there would not be a, a Redux. So looking at DUM, and we will look at everything um, in depth. So a DUM component really relies on no external application state logic. It just is a function of properties, right? This is pure. I can do anything I want with it, but I have to give its API explicit properties. I'm not reaching out into any action or store. There's nothing here that ties it to anything. It's a pure UI component. Um, it's a very simple component, but and in use, I have to provide everything. I have to handle everything outside of myself. All right, so smart. These are dumb components, which should be the majority of your components in your application, wrapped in an environmentally aware container. So we'll look at these in depth, too. And what does that really mean? I mean, environmentally aware is really the whole flux model, right? Stores, state, um, actions, anything to do with the application itself. It's not presentation specific. These should be have a place and a name. And so we're going to identify those. All right, so the render process. So again, we're going to start at zero. Um, first, we need to, again, revisit f of x equals y. Every component should be potent and take properties. And as an application, we gather all these um, render calls, and we figure out what the tree will look like. So graphically, we call render. We render our entire tree, and we get all these render fragments. We diff them with the previous render fragments. And anything that's different, we produce an update. Right? That will update the DOM, update you know, mobile device, whatever, whatever platform it's actually dri driving to. Um, and it's important to note that the updates are batched. OK, so how does React see a pure component? Well, let's take a step back and ask what pure is again. Pure is, since I'm a function of my properties, I'm f of x, so I take you know, three properties, then I should be able to compute the should component update method, lifecycle method, to understand if I need to re-render. Right? If I don't need to re-render, then neither do my subtree. And this, is, this is pretty basic, but this is important because these concepts are how you game react. Right? This is what you need to be thinking about when you design a pure or a high performance system. So this, and we'll, the next slide will kind of anticipate or explicitly des describe what happens in a render. Right? So we have five fragments that we're going to pull out. But the pure node that we've defined as pure, he doesn't need to render because something else happened in the application that he doesn't depend on. right? So he can just say, take my previous render fragment. And what this really saves you is JavaScript processing. All right? So 
um, by calling pure or by calling render, you basically run the run the JavaScript render method on every component in your tree. Okay, by circumventing it with a pure object somewhere in your tree, you can replace that subtree with a previous render. Pretty um, basic, but yet extremely important to understand fully. This is what's happening. All right. So how do you load data into uh, React components. There are two real ways to do this. Top down, which is through the composition model, and then sideways, which is through a smart container. Um, and I would consider most applications a heavily mixture of both. Right? You have to tie yourself to your application state, but you do not want to tie your presentation logic to your application state. So you have a happy medium um, between top down. So we saw top down, um, parent to child, and then we see sideways, which is just one level up. We take our dumb components and we make them smart, right? We include our actions, we include our state. Uh, this is much like if you're using connect. What does connect do? It puts the actions and the state and the stores into your class that is pure, that doesn't have any references to these things. And you notice that these should be separate files, right? My container should go in a folder called containers. And that is the one place that is your integration point. When you go to reuse any of this component library, you don't touch this or the test. You don't touch anything to do with your pure components, your dumb components. They have no tie to the system. You take the tests, you can create a library, they stand and live alone. All right, so drilling down into top down, um, the portable, like we just said, we can reuse them. They're easily modeled as pure components because they just take properties, right? They don't tie in anything. They're not going to reach around and get data from somewhere else. So they're, they're, they're driven from top down. So they're simple to test, too. They have an API. You can mock everything that you're giving to it as a function, and you can see if the, there were interactions on those um, or easily control them, right? You're not having to mock the world. All right. So a typical application that's rendered top down at least a year ago looked like this, right? Flux, you would push some actions down, and when your actions um, change state, you'd have some dispatcher and some store event listener on your route, and you'd render the whole guy. And if you were smart, you used pure components to try to slow this down, right? Well, a lot changed. Well, I'll get to that, I guess. So a lot changed. Um, this year for me, so I got to go to React Conf, and a guy there named Jason Bonta talked about containers. Um, and really, all a container is is saying, well, instead of doing this at the root, let's do this at certain levels within the tree that makes sense. Let's apply some properties to them, to them. And this has really kind of morphed over the last year from the word container into smart. But I still think both are synonymous, um, and you should you should understand them both um, when you're talking about them. But Sideways data loaded components are self insulating. That means I know everything there is to know about how to render my children, so don't tell me when to render. Anything above me does not trigger a render, so I will self insulate. And not only that, but I have the responsibility to make sure everything underneath me, all my child nodes, all my subtree, has all the data they need, and I'm going to make sure that they render properly. Right? So this is, this is where we start building applications that look like this. Right? This is a modern application where we have smart components mixed in that are tied to application-specific knowledge. And then we have a set of dumb components underneath of them doing top-down data flow. OK, so data. This is probably my favorite slide. But, um, yeah. So there are ways. And there are only three basic ways for a React component to get data, right? unless you're going to go outside of React. Um, props, state, or context. And everything that you do, every framework that you use, is going to use these. Um, most frameworks tend to favor context because they're less invasive, but there is weight there. All right, so let's look at defining your properties. Right? Again, we're driving this home that if you're a function of your properties, you're simple. Right? This is easily testable. Right? We start moving complexity um, when we start talking about state. Right? So I like this example because 
we're composing again. We're taking a previous, sorry, a previous property object, and we're not changing it. So we tested that guy. That guy's in our UI library, right? Now we're going to wrap him into a stateful context, and now we have a stateful version of this thing. So we can keep composing these guys um, into testable units, and this one is more complicated, right? Because now we're dealing with state, not only props. But the same concept applies. We can wrap this again, and I didn't do this um, in this example, but we can wrap this again in a context. And let's say that we wanted to refactor, in the previous example, we wanted to refactor out this call where class names, we're actually defining the classes that, that are going to be toggled on this guy. Or we can use context, which is a good example for context for theming. We use context to pass down CSS. And then if we refactor this, I, I would refactor my base component, my property, to accept classes. And then my stateful component would have to also accept classes and inject classes. And then this guy would be a little bit different. But basically, the only thing that changes is we switch from styles um, instead of classes. And we're pulling in a context. This is nice because if you're not used to context, is they travel with a tree, but they don't have to be explicit. The one thing about um, collapsible components, or sorry, um, context-aware components is that they are more like a smart, contain smart component. You have to carry around this context with you or else it won't work. So this example, I would refactor to be a container. Right. All right. So the component taxonomy. Right? What do we call things within React? Um, this is best practices that are being pulled out of the internet. These are not things that I'm just making up. These are, you know, you can search pretty much any one of these and find a nice article or a nice GitHub project that is exemplifying these concepts. Um, again, this is just the best practices. So a class, all right. So first I have a nice little React component running and I, I'm going to talk about that for a second. So in each one of these taxonomies, I'm going to run a little demo here that basically produces a, a progress bar. But the, the trick is that this is gained such that every tick is 1.4 pixels wide and it, every tick is a div. So this is putting a lot of content into, into you know, the DOM. And every, I'm using a, a, a performance tool called Benchmark JS to render this thing as fast as possible. Okay. So in a class system, which is just the standard top down, nothing special, like we're not using any pure components, we're not using any gaming, um, we get something like this. We'll see an overall view, but just be conscious of these bars as they kind of go by. Um, okay, so a class based system. We can extend the component, which is off of React, and return the render method. Dom. It's a lot like stateless, but we're actually given now as a class, we're given a full life cycle. So we have should component update, we'll receive props, we have the whole gamut, right? everything we're used to. All right, so here's an example class from Redux to do MVC, really just highlighting the, that it can be more complex. Okay, so stateless, micro componentization, and dumb. These are not all synonymous, but they are all similar. So they all have traits and benefits, such as application-specific dependencies. They don't have any, right? They are application unaware, so these build up your component library. And this is important because as an enterprise, as, as a shared community, you can easily adopt or pull any of these components in without having to worry about how they interact with your system. You define your container separately. Right. They have an intuitive API because they are purely API. It's a function that takes properties. There's nothing else magical about it. Right? Um, they're self-insulating, which um, we'll see what that means. But basically, we're talking about um, pure components. They're highly testable because they are a function of their properties, and they're portable. All right. So stateless, we've seen this, these type of examples so far. These are really what React wants you to make the most use of within your application, right? Things that just compose simple other components as properties, right? There's nothing, you can't use state here because you don't have life cycle. But um, you can do complex things. And, and we'll see that, like here, I mean, we can 
do classes. We can even add handlers. You know, we can do anything we want as long as we're not full of state because we don't have any life cycles to work with. All right, so pure components should make up most of your application and should be, anytime you see anything that you're doing, you should try to refactor this way. All right, so a DOM component is a little bit different. Um, a DOM component is not stateless, but a stateless component is DOM. So a DOM component is technically a class that is defined by its API. So we're not in the stateless mode anymore. We're actually as a React class. And just an example, like when we're looking at the API of a DOM component, they're intuitive, right? I know what's going to happen to these, this input component, right? It has a value and it has an on-chain handler. It's very self-explaining. I don't need to know what's in there. I need to know what API it has. I don't need to know anything else. The collapsible um, the, the example we've been talking about. We have children properties and we have a, an API to this collapsible. There's nothing else that I need to know. There's no internal state to this guy because I'm defining whether or not it's open. I'm handling the toggle, right? And then a login. So something like this, uh, a list of providers. I can easily reason that, okay, well, I'm going to allow Facebook, Google Plus, and GitHub accounts to be able to log into this guy. Um, Okay, so what else are they? Besides an API that's well-defined, they're also self-insulating. So there should component update. They understand themselves as properties so they can determine when they should render. Right. They're highly testable. Um, and yeah, we'll skip that. And the portable because any project can include these. All right, so what is a container and a smart or smart? These are synonymous. Um, Containers are application aware, as I said before. Um, these are really the secret sauce when you're writing well-architected React. You're going to keep all your components separate. You're going to keep them clean from your environment. And then you're going to wrap them into a container that makes it useful to you. Right? Um, again, containers are loaded with sideways data. And containers. Um, aren't necessarily reusable. They're not supposed to be driven for reusability. They're supposed to be application specific. All right, so here's our link or our view again, where each green node is a smart component that's responsible for a subtree, responsible, it's self-insulating, so the parent will not tell it to render. And it has a direct relationship with the state of the application and the actions available to the application. All right. So property container should have no or very minimal properties. Um, this is something that Jason Benita stressed. I, I think no properties is fine, but there are cases when you want properties. You just want to add something to it. But as a general rule, no properties for a container because they are self-insulating. What are you going to give something that doesn't need to, anything to be given? Um, they're insulated from changes in their parent tree. So we'll see that. And they're responsible for vending children. So no. Uh, no props for their API. Should component update? False. Right? We're not going to render if our parent if our parent renders. And we're responsible for rendering child components when data changes. This is very fluxy. If you were used to flux um, about a year ago, this is what a lot of these type of components would have been. The only difference is these may have actually been mixed in with your components, right? They wouldn't have been separated out as a container that would have been part of your tree, right? So now we're suggesting and really making the design pattern, these are application specific things. Right? And so as an example, um, we look at our hello world again, and specifically we're gonna name these containers. They're gonna go into a container bucket, just like we have a component bucket. These are going in a container bucket. These are gonna do everything that we just described. So we're going to set some state, which is going to pull um, data from our store. It's also going to have a change handler um, from an action. Could have many actions, many stores here, however you model it. We're going to bind to the store. We're going to listen for change events. We're not going to render on our parent. And then we're going to render our component. Uh, you don't have to render one container per um, comp underlying component. That's not, um, that's not part of the pattern. Anything can be a container. Um, you can have anything in your render method as long as your container is self-aware for all the data that is needed by your children. Right? And you would use it something like this, hello world container. He's self-describing. 
He's, he's insulated. All right, so higher order components. These are really the next generation of mix-ins, next generation of making life easier for us. Um, I think, yeah, I had a little demo here, I forgot. So this one is actually a little bit faster than the class one. You see, we get a lot more ticks that can be rendered, and you'll see them all close together um, in a minute. Okay, higher order components. These are considerably slower. Um, I'm gaming the system right here because I'm wrapping each tick that is an example in about five containers. So I'm wrapping one, one stateless component in five classes and rendering it as fast as possible. And it's pretty slow, actually. Um, not say that's a game changer for not using higher components. I would say that you just need to be aware of, of what's actually happening under the covers. It takes a lot of overhead for React to deal with just passing your data to a class. Um, but we'll look at that in depth in a little bit. All right, so higher order components. Right? Here is that idea where I'm wrapping a component. Um, yeah, so let's look down just a little bit. Okay, so I have Hello World and I have my wrap higher order component. When I wrap my Hello World, I get a new, comp I get a new React class. Right? So I'm wrapping a stateless component into a React class. And if I did that five times, you, you, you get some bloat. But we'll see that Recompose is a, uh, a library that I think it just actually opened, open sourced uh, two weeks ago. We're going to make use of that pretty heavily to get these kind of things. The idea of wrap right here is pretty contrived. There's no reason why you would do this. You would do this for something like mixing in pure functionality or mixing in things that are uh, maybe the right one to mix in actions. A good example here is connect in, Re in Redux. Connect is really just a higher order component that produces a very knowledgeable component for you based on what you give it. Right? He's going to subscribe to data. He's going to subscribe to events and make a smart component for you. All right, so here's another naive uh, approach at you know trying to do something very fluxy. I'm going to create a higher order component that's going to take component and some form of actions and state. And I game this a little bit because my state is actually, every time this thing renders, it will get the next state. Um, this is not how you should do this, but it is a way you can do it. Um, this is just an example for higher components. You should really use Redux for something like this with the connect method. But this is an example of higher order components and then and containers. Yeah, I guess the exemplify ex example here I'm trying to make is that we're creating a container that the container is now just a higher order function. We're going to bind our actions and our states together to produce a smart component. Right? That is exactly what Connect does. That is exactly what I'm trying to explain here. Um, again, if you want to see these not ES6, put them in Babel. Um, if you want to play with them, play them with, with React 14. All right, pure components. Pure components are your, are your best friend. Right? Every component you have should be pure. There's no reason for it not to be, unless it's a container, I guess. Um, even I guess even a container is pure. So they rely completely on properties, as we said, and they implement this one method, should component update. Um, and remember, when React sees your pure methods, He's going to game the render process. Right? You're going to get all this JavaScript processing back. So when we look at this um, example happen, we're going to actually be quite a bit faster than we were with just stateless components, way faster than higher order components. And as pure, we don't have to do as much. So every time I push on a new tick into this, um, into this render, only, in, only price I'm having to pay is the fact that I have to loop over them to, to render them. But I do not have to render them. I use my previous render fragment and the no JavaScript processing at all. Right? So I have extra one, one fragment was created and I have one um, diff added to, added to the batch every time I add one tick. All right, so, okay, so higher order components to the rescue, right? So instead of having to do 
instead of having to think about, okay, well, I want to use stateless components, but um, but I also want the power of a class and a life cycle, right? So this is where recompose comes in, and you should definitely write this down as far as a library to look at. It is an order um, component library that's just going to give you a bunch of utilities to wrap your components with state, to wrap your components with properties, to do things that you're already doing, like making them pure. So in this example, what is actually happening? We're taking a stateless React component, and we're exporting it. And then we're exporting default, a pure version of it. And the version is a full-blown React class that's going to delegate to um, your Hello World component and mix in, um, mix in a ship component update, already pre-assembled and pre-wired. Very trivial concept, but huge performance wins. And we're going to see that um, a recommendation is exporting both of these, one defaulted and one constant you can test these things a lot easier, right? I don't have abstractions on top of things. I'm exporting the pure component. I'm going to destructure that world, get the real hello world, not the pure wrapped one, and test the functionality. I don't have to test pure because it's from a library. It's already tested. All right. So again, we can talk about testing, but really, if you've done a lot of testing within React, um, you know that it has has some value for keeping properties um, or talking, testing dumb components is way easier, way less infrastructure. Here is an entire component for me creating, because I have um, an API, I can send down the change handlers, interact with the underlying field, and then just validate that my local state has changed. Right? I don't need to go down into that component and see. I'm completely in control. So testing is simpler. and. We're going to expose simple components along this way I just basically alluded to. Um, by doing this, it's a lot easier to test. It, it just, it's inherent when you're looking at your code that, um, that everything is pure. So you have a, a component library that's stateless, that's, that's also wrapped in, in, in a gamed system. So when anybody uses this, they don't have to worry. If the process doesn't change, they incur no penalty for rendering. All right. So in practice, right? So if we look at Redux to do MVC, this is pretty typical of most good code. Right out of their example. Um, I have some state. It has no application specific knowledge because this is one of the one of the core concepts of Redux is um, wrapping everything in a in a connect block. So you have dumb components everywhere, and it has sub render methods. So here's a sub render method: render toggle all. Right. This is a stateless component. The only thing that actually this has a bug in it. You have to return something from a stateless component. You can't return null. Um, that's the only thing I don't like about stateless components. Actually, yeah, I'm even missing an error there. All right, so, oh no, sorry, this is not, I, I jumped ahead of myself. This is the actual sub-render method from the MVC example. Here's another sub-render method, and then here's your main render, which we call out, right? We call it this.render toggle all. We're also going to render, um, render the first. These are common patterns that we do. But these are good choices, good examples for us to extract. Right? There's no reason for these for us to adopt this render, sub-render method. Right? We have components. We can wrap them as stateless objects, and we can wrap them in pure components. And we don't even have to render them if they didn't change. And we can test them independently. Right? So if we refactor this guy, we're going to create a pure components. So we're going to create toggle all pure component. We're going to export him purely and go ahead and export him on un, pure so that he um, is easily testable. We're going to also extract our footer, right? And here we have a pretty complicated um, stateless component. We have a change handler that's going to actually do something for us. But we can do all this with a stateless component. There's really no um, drawbacks to this, and it's Again, it's pure. Uh, is again, I have to render something. So before we said if to do is link greater than zero, 
we turn nothing, we have no footer or no toggle all. Here we actually have to render something because we're stateless. That is a drawback. And then our render method is really just two components and then a list, right? So we're simplifying. We're starting to take components that we used to think were beautiful, that we used to think were best practices, and we can apply better practices. Right? All right. So the demo that I've been kind of sprinkling throughout here is, is this. It's a, uh, a tick, which is a stateless component. Um, very simple, right? It's just going to add this. And the only reason why we're using data equals data, or data tick equals data as a data attribute here, is to get some kind of change. Right? I need something to change within this component. All right, we're going to export it pure. So we're going to gain it. Right? We're also going to have a legend that shows us some information about what's going on. We're going to name that guy. And we're going to have a progress bar, which is going to render our legend. And yeah, it's going to render our legend, and then it's going to render the render ticks, which is children or um, this mapper. And I'll show you what that is in a second. All right, and then we have a wrapper function that we, that we talked about earlier. This is a higher order component. We're going to wrap. Um, the example that is wrapped, we're going to wrap this guy in basically five layers of higher components. And the only reason I do this is just to see what the performance drawbacks are. Because recompose is really, really interesting because it's basically saying, I want, my, I want my component to be pure. I want it to be with props. I want it to be with state. I want it to be all these things. And instead of making one super component where you do all these, they're just going to compose your stateless component into a out into a class, um, and then he's going to wrap that class, that pure class, into a stateful class, and then he's going to wrap that stateful class into a pure class, and so you're going to end up with three classes deep, right? Turns out not to be the best thing for performance, um, but I definitely don't think that it's out of the question yet. So, um, so we have classes. This is just a standard React class, no gaming of the DOM. We're just looking at ticks being rendered. Then we look at um, stateless methods. So if we just switch to stateless components, kind of abstraction we just did, what changes? We get a little bit more performance. If we game every component that we have to, to export themselves as pure, we get more performance, right? And if we wrap them in deeply nested higher order components, so five um, ticks, we're going to get Pretty bad performance, actually. I mean, if we look at these top three, I'm going to wait for this thing to finish. If we look at the top three, so the top one is, is stateless, then pure, then high order components. There's not too much difference. Sometimes pure is actually quite a bit better. But between class stateless and pure, pure is always going to win. Um, and higher order components, this one is pretty gamed, and it's pretty bad. And if you look at the flame chart here, there's a very deep um, amount of processing that has to go on. So the timeline isn't that long. They're all about the same. But the amount of processing that has to happen to jump through each um, create element class level is causing a lot of slowness. All right, so here's, here's interesting. I actually came up with this by accident. I was just seeing what would happen if instead of rendering, so if we go back, instead of rendering, if we look at this mapper, we're going to render it single tick, either wrapped, um, pure, or regular. That's what the tick strategy is. And then we're just going to you know, map them using the map. We're going to render our render ticks. What if we pass them in as children and we, in our test, push a new component on. Not something I would want to do in a store. Maybe I would do it internally to a state, to an app, to a React component. I definitely don't want React components in my stores. But the performance is huge, actually. The whole performance out, there is no reason to even use pure, or use class, or use stateless. And I really don't understand um, what that means, honestly. I think it's really just something that is not a best practice, but if I needed it, if I had to have it, there was something that I needed to do, I might use it. Because um, it's, I mean, it's quite a bit faster. 
I, I guess just to be a little bit more explicit, these ticks, or if we can look at the code, but these ticks are pushed, are created and then pushed onto an array and fed as children. So I'm not looping over them. I'm just giving them to the owner as children. Right? There's no there's no processing involved to render myself. React does that processing, right? React's going to figure out what children um, need to be updated. And you can see that if we run the same test as we did before, much faster. So maybe there's a back pocket idea. I'll do this. Um, definitely wouldn't put this in state, and I wouldn't pass this. Or I would put this in state, and I wouldn't pass this around because you don't want references to your React components. All right. Well, that's pretty much it, I guess. Is there any questions? So when you're doing things like, sorry, I should, <laughs> uh, when you're doing things like trying to optimize mm -hmm. these things, and you're looking for things like extraneous renders, right. are there any tools that you have found that are especially good at instrumenting those, like pull metrics out to see how well you've done? Well, have you looked at React Perf, like the actual built-in Perf monitoring? So it has a built-in perf. Um, you can use it. Uh, basically, you start and stop it. And it will tell you every place that you are rendering unnecessarily. I mean, it's, it's down to the T. And if you start wrapping your components in pure, that number of wasted time will go to zero. It's very, very efficient. It's very sweet. And you just look at your console. It's printing out tables for you. They have a ton of information. In fact, if we look. Do I have to pass it already? Right above the thing. Yeah, this is, this is what you're looking for. Um, you're going to start and stop, and you're going to you know, print some inclusive members. I've played around with this a few times to find certain things, but as a general consensus, I try to make everything pure, so I don't have to do these things. Um, yeah. Anybody else? You said earlier that uh, some components don't have, uh, don't know about the what about the plus actions? Right. Okay, so... Okay, so the, the real... Tr oops. The real secret sauce to a dumb component is this idea. That you are a function of your properties. So there's nothing stopping my input example here from being an action. Says, um, you know, update input for this field. It's a specific action handler tied to my logic. So I have a container that I would wrap, and let's try to find that. I have a container, just like here, where I have an action called update text. I'm binding that to my state saying, here is your update method. And then when I re-render, I pass it down, top method from parent to child, so that when my child needs to update text, he's calling an action. He doesn't know he's calling an action. He knows he's calling a function. That's just a property. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Uh, just to follow up on that, what if your action is like constants, for example, like a lot of do, and then you also pass down the constants as a problem? Well, I consider constants, I guess that's an interesting question. I, mostly my examples, I'll put constants as part of the application, as part of um, as part of a DOM component's knowledge. But if that seems too tied to your application state, then bind it somewhere and pass down the bound function. Right? So, yeah. Or you can use context. But again, context, I would recommend you using context at a container level and not at the, the dumb component level. Yeah. Yeah, I also have a couple of sure. um, So when you're testing functions that you wrap in as, as a pure function, um, do you then have to do anything like destructure that to then be able to like access the state of your white box testing, or is, is there like any concerns there? Well, I would testing things that you have wrapped in pure. I guess it depends. So in this example. Oh, let's go up one. Okay. 
So in this example, right, we're explicitly exporting two objects from every class. Okay, we're going to export the underlying component, and then we're going to export the defaulted pure. So everything in our application is going to be pure by default. But you destructure this guy. So I would say import, import in brackets destructured hello world from you know the hello world component, and I will get the pure component, and I'll test with that. Or I'll inject that into, into my test. And I, by testing this way, and by structuring this way, you can test pieces, and then you don't have to worry about it in the wild. 